<clears throat> Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's lecture. We are continuing our discussion of introduction to business management. And in today's session, we are looking at chapter 12 of our book that we are following. Um, chapter 12 concerns human resource management, and the SA labor legislation framework, human resource management, and the SA labor regulations labor legislation framework. At the end of this learning outcome, we will be able to describe basic stakes involved in human resource planning, explain how companies use recruiting to find qualified job appliance, describe the selection techniques and procedures that companies use when deciding which applicant should receive job offers, describe how to determine training needs and select the appropriate training methods, discuss how to use performance appraisal to give meaningful performance feedback, describe basic compensation strategies and how they affect human resource practice, describe the role of human resource functions in organizations, explain the contribution human resource management can make to the effectiveness of an organization. We also continue with our learning outcome, list and explain different content theories of motivation, um, explain contribution, the contribution of human resource management and make to the effectiveness of an organization. Outline who is responsible for human resource management, list and explain different theories of motivation, discuss the process of motivation, evaluate the different motivation strategies, understand the importance of constitution of the Republic of South Africa, 1996, describe the impact of the act of the management of human resource, provide an outline of who is responsible for human resource. This presentation will take this format, the introduction, the relationship between the line management and the human resource department, the human resource planning, finding qualified talent, developing talent, retaining talent, motivating employees, labor legislation, and the impact in the workplace. So far in our discussion, one important thing that we should know is that we try to look at other aspects of um, human rights and business management and how to improve them. Today we are looking at a very exceptional and a very important aspect, that is the human resource. The employees, how to get people the skills, the resource, how to get the actual people to face in certain positions, how to ensure they are motivated. Basically, it's what we are discussing today. It's what we are discussing today. So we begin our discussion with the relationship between the line management and human resource. And here we are going to start with the human resource function. So the human resource is basically one of the important aspects in an organization because they actually play a significant role in the role of being a strategic partner. And also the human resource also demonstrates the organization regarding the people. Not just as a strategic partner to an organization in terms of how to identify professionals um, who have the media skills or specialists are fundamental in terms of the businesses that we are running. So they tend to improve skills based of employees and contribute to the profitability of an organization. They tend to give not just the skills and profitability of an organization, in terms of giving accountability in terms of how people are performing and how skills are, are being um, maximized. They are also basically concerned with this in um, the use of recruiting in terms of how to recruit people, select people, train them, develop talent, rewarding them and assisting as well as motivating them. So the human resource, the function, basically involves all of this. So if you have a business and you want to need or you need to want to employ people to assist you, you should be able to have, I mean, a resource, human resource department that tends to help you in terms of mobilizing the needed skill sets that are needed to transform your business. So one important aspect of this human resource is also 
the integration, the focus should be on integration and teamwork among the employees. So they basically, you know that in the businesses, we have different departments in terms of the finance, in terms of um, the operations, in terms of the marketing. And human resource is basically responsible for recruiting all the people under this section. And we also have the human resource department as well. So they should have a form of teamwork and a form of integration so that with the skill set that are being grouped under the marketing, the finance, and everything, it will all work in, in tandem and to work together for the success of an organization, for the success of the organization. So we continue our discussion with looking at human management, human resource management and organizational effectiveness. One interesting thing for an organization to be called effective is that it must have a vision, it must have a mission, it must have a strategy and the organizational structure as well as the human resource. One important thing is that the people that you employ in the, um, in the business are those people who tend to create the ideas and just to foster your visions, your missions, to ensure the success of this company. So for every organization or what we term as a um, basic every human um, resource management in a company has certain attributes. What are these attributes? We can talk about the primary attributes and if we talk of the primary um, attributes or primary benefits and basically we're concerned with issues of monetary benefits like pay, pension, and share options. We can also talk about the secondary benefits and working conditions. Here, these are the non-monetary benefits like leave allowance, flexible working conditions, inputs, innovations, recognitions. We can also talk about training. Another attribute of human resource management is training and development. That is the ability to function related development initiatives. So we can also talk about career development, and this includes long-term career path development. So once you go into a certain business, you know that, oh, you start as a, a, a lecturer, then you should be able to aim as to becoming the vice chancellor. So there's a career development. Or you start as a master student who is a lecturer, your aim is to attain your PhD, get your PhD, attain your professor. You build your career in the long term. And another thing is the company's culture and diversity. So about human resource, basically, it combines the efforts of employees to establish a strong company culture. And when we talk of a strong company culture, we are talking about the social and networking opportunities, diversity initiative, corporate social responsibility programs, and employee input. And employee input. So looking at the attributes basically that um, are for human resource management. Now we we'll move on to look at the contribution of human resource and organizational development. The contribution of human resource to an organizational development. So for human organizational to be effective, as you're saying, every company should treat human resource as a very key important element. Because if you have the right skills and the right mentality, the right needed in a company, your company is in a safe hands. As a top manager, you need not to worry about uh, uh, um, whether they are going to perform or not because you have entrusted it into people with the right ability. So what are the various ways of contributing to human resource? And how does human resource contribute to organizational effectiveness? We can talk about assisting everybody to reach its goals. The human resource indeed assists everybody to reach its goals. It assists the finance people to attain their goals. It assists each individual in the campaign because there's a set target and they tend to know that you are being employed for a certain particular job. So they help you to achieve that job. So efficient use of skills and ability. So the efficient use of skills and ability, they also uh, contribute by Contribution of human resource organization, um, contribution of human resource organizational effective will also include providing the organization with trained and motivated employees. It also assists in the attainment of employees, job satisfaction, and self-actualization. 
to the end to ensure that the employees were satisfied, motivated, and self actualized. It also develop a quality of work life that makes employment in an organizational development desirable. So this implies that it's not just about employing people, but ensuring that they have the environment where employee gets more satisfied and um, job making him uh, and desire. And when employee is more desired or more satisfied, he tends to put him his or her maximum best to ensure the company succeed. They also assist with the maintenance of ethical policies and socially responsible behaviors. They assist them with the maintenance of ethical policies and social responsible behavior. Managing change to the mutual advantage of individuals, groups, and organization and the public. They also executing human resource function activities in a professional manner. So they contribute to human resource activities in a professional manner. Basically, they are also being involved in strategic decision making, strategic formulation of the organization. So these are some of the key elements or key contributing human resource elements to the effectiveness of an organization, to the effectiveness of an organization. So every organization must indeed have a human resource specialist. And the human resource specialist, they tend to perform the human resource function. They tend to perform the human resource function and basically the functions of recruiting and selection, scaling of work, training and development, performance management, compensation of employees are mostly some of the duties that are performed by the human resource specialists. We continue our discussion by looking at the human resource planning. And when you talk of the human resource planning, it's a process of using the organizational goals and strategy to focus the organizational human resource needs in terms of finding, developing, and keeping qualified human resource. So basically, when we talk of human resource planning, it's all about how does the system in place to ensure that you find the actual and the right skill set for a particular position in an organization. So it is a process of using organizational goals and strategies to focus organizational human resource needs in terms of finding developing and keeping qualified human resources. And in terms of doing that, we can put it in three phases. So in terms of the human resource planning, we can put it in three phases. Phase one, identifying the work done in an organization. Phase two, the human resource forecasting. And phase three, the human resource plan. We are going to take each of these phases and we are going to discuss. One important aspect of the organization, or the first phase that is identifying the work in organization. Before anybody is being employed, then we must know the work the person is going to do. Nobody is going to be employed to sit idle in the company. So we must understand what are the duties, what are the functions or the position that the person is being employed for, what the person is going to do and contribute to the employment process. So when we talk about them, Work to be done, then we must look at three main aspects. That is the job analysis. And the job analysis is followed with three. Without, one is being followed, it generates two outcomes a job description and a job specification. So these are three important aspects which basically needs to be understood when we tend to identify the work to be done in our organization. So, job analysis, we start with job analysis. The first step in human resource for work to be done. So job analysis is basically the process, is the process by which organization, by which management systematically investigates the tasks, duties, and responsibility of the job within an organization. The process used to investigate the tasks, duties, and responsibility of an organization. Now, basically, certain questions, what is the employee responsible for? What tasks are performed? what decisions are made, what information is needed to enable the work to be done, under which conditions in the job should be done. So once you are able to find answers to all these questions, then it means that you are analyzing the job just to find out, investigate the task, the duties, responsibility of the particular position in the, um, 
the Tambani show occupied in a particular job. We can also talk about job description. So the job description, basically, once you see any form of adverts, you realize that they are, um, they are they basically give out a spelled information about what the job is about. So job description, job description is an information is put in a written, in a certain format. The written format, listen content of the job. So once you see any advert of most professional companies in terms of when they advert, advertising, realize that they give a job description as what a written format of listing of the content of the job. So a job description is not just merely a list of facts. It is usually prepared in a predetermined format so that it's easily readable. It generally starts with a job title, the purpose of the job, what the position holder will have to do, for example, the role, responsibilities, tax, and duties. So these are the written aspects. And as I said, it is mostly seen in terms of announcements of jobs. Then we'll move on to the job specification. Details, knowledge, skills, ability relevant to the job. So with the job specification here, we are interested in the person's ability to um, execute. So you now ask for the person's knowledge, the skills, the ability relevant to the job. And this will include the person's education, experience, specialized trainings, personal traits, mutual dexterity of the person doing the job. So in terms of the specification, you go beyond what the, what the description is about to look at, whether the person has the ability, the skills to execute the job. Another important or the second phase in the human resource planning is the human resource forecasting. Is the human resource forecasting. And with the human resource forecasting is to balance the human resource supply and the human resource demand. So it's to balance the human resource supply and the human resource demand. So demand aspect is affected by business objectives. It's affected by the business objective because these objectives determine the number of people needed to attain them. So the demand side actually is affected by the business objective. How many do you need to ensure that the company, and how many does the company needs at a particular point in time for a particular production? At the supply side, is basically affected by the human resource program, provided the human resource. So the supply side is provided by the human resource program. How many tools are grooming people in terms of the particular job? So that is the supply side. The skill set that are available, the population aspects of it. So that supply of human resources basically from the, the, the populace. And the demand side is from the companies who basically demand. So they are basically factors to consider when you are doing forecasting. You must consider the economic growth. And when you talk of the economic growth, this basically involves the forecasting of expected growth of the business in terms of the uh, um, economic development. So if in the, uh, what the economic conditions in terms of, if you want, the more you employ people, research, most research has shown that um, if you increase your labor uh, and input in the company, it helps your company to grow. But this is not always the case because if you tend to overemploy, which is basically common in most government organization, if you tend to uh, overemploy in most government organization, people become redundant. People don't want to go to work because they know that, oh, a lot of people they don't have anything to do in the work and it's less have negative impact. So in terms of economic growth, too, what basically we look out for is economic development. In the terms of recession, what happens? Like even when we're going through South Africa going through recession and the world economy is going through recession, you see how it has affected the, the, the demand for labor. Uh, and most people were cut off from their company because of the economic development that had happened. We can also talk about the new development in the business. So the new development in the business, we tend to look at the fiscal extension establishment of new branches and the technological changes. So if maybe there are new branches, you realize that the demand for uh, um, labor or demand for the human resource may increase. But if in terms of technological changes, which may tend to replace um, certain labor requirements, then you realize that the demand will reduce. 
we realized that the demand reduced, such as the banking sector, where initially we used to have tellers where people have to go to the bank to do deposits and others. Today, they are deposit machines that so you just need to go to those places, and most banks have cut off those kind of um, teller um, um, services unless you have a special need. So he realizes that all of this tends to uh, affect the focusing of human resources. And we can also talk about the labor markets. So the labor market here, we are looking at the terms of the high level of unemployment, the opportunities in the labor market are they sufficient enough. Some companies, some companies indeed have um, um, low uh, human resource, others to have surplus. South Africa, for example, there's high unemployment situation uh, because the supply of labor is exceeding the demand. In other countries, such as Canada, they are looking for human resource basically too, because their demand is more and their supply of human resource is less. So these are some of the factors that basically we look at. The final step in the human resource plan is the human resource plan. The human resource is the human resource plan. So the purpose of this uh, final step is to provide a concrete guidelines and steps that indicate how the business short term, long and medium and long term human resource requirements can be provided for. So it is it tends to answer the question as to what must we do today to prepare for tomorrow. So this guide, the human resource plan tells us that uh, if your company starts at this level or progress to this level, how many people will be needed? And as time goes on, how many people can be maybe factored in terms of the medium and the long term, how the company should expand to. So if the human resource plan basically have a strategy, in making it more practical in terms of today, what most companies do is that once you apply, because of the large pool of people's application, they tend to put people on hold. And when as time goes on and they move those people, they tend to bring on those people in terms of the medium term. Sometimes you apply for work for interview, they do their selection and they tend to put you on hold just for the later time for you to be engaged when the company starts to expand. So basically, that's what the human resource plan does. It gives the guidelines as to the steps and about how your business short-term, long-term resource plan should be. One important aspect of every human resource is to find the qualified talent. Find the qualified talent. So recruiting is to ensure that a sufficient number of and competent applicants apply for the jobs in the business as when required. Now, for a human resource manager, your one important function is to identify the right skill. Because whenever there's a vacant position, announcements are made and people apply. When a country that has more supply of labor than demand, you realize that you get a pool of, and you need to screw through, you need to screw through to identify people who may have that skill set that your company needs to make sure that the company progress. So how are recruitment done? Recruitment are basically done from either the inside or from the outside. So from inside is what we call the internal recruitment. So basically, members who are already working in that company at lower positions may be um, given opportunity to apply for certain vacant position in the um, uh, and fill in or to get into a senior job position. So smaller position, you started the work as a, a teller or a, at a short price or something, and then new position to become a supervisor role. So this is an internal recruitment. So internal recruitment, and it has to do side and it bad side. It has to do side and it bad side. In terms of uh, internal uh, um, recruitment, it basically helps what you call um, career planning becomes possible. So somebody who has a career plan, you know, when you know that, um, for example, even people in the university, whenever there's a position in the university and you employ people in that same university to fill, person who start as a, a, a research assistant then to have a career plan in becoming a professor. So you start as a research assistant, his desire to progress and advance himself. Also, another thing you can also talk about this is that 
assessment of applicants is easier because of internal recruitment. The person has already worked in that company, so you can assess the person's performance and abilities. Also, the cost of recruitment is low because, I mean, advertisement, there's no need for you to invest or so much investment. Maybe just a simple notice at the um, company's board for people with lower positions to apply for this available position. It also may happen at disadvantages in terms of internal recruitment. So internal recruitment tends to stagnate because members often think they are like a predecessors. So if maybe the change in that company that the company wants may not be paid so much because the subordinates that are being progressed are being given new positions. They are going to basically act as the people who are already there and they don't tend to bring new skills on board. Staff appointed at the lower levels do not necessarily have the potential to fill senior management positions. So maybe the required skill sets may not be available. It may not be available in the sense that somebody may have worked half that special skill set as a supervisor, but because she just wants somebody from um, a teller or to progress those in the company, somebody from outside may have that ability to transform and think that the uh, um, company's focus compared to somebody who has just been um, 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 promoted from the lower level to the higher level. There can be a lot of personal competition among colleagues. So you realize that because such opportunities are available, most um, individuals who are competing among themselves in terms of cutting and undercutting each other just to get to the top side. We can also talk about Recruitment from outside and recruitment from outside is also what we call the external recruitment. So here, recruitment from outside simply means you are looking for suitable applicants outside the business or company, outside the business or company. It also has its own good side or bad side. So basically, in terms of professional bodies, even in the university, sometimes we employ people from other institutions just to come and fill in positions that are available. So that's a recruiting from outside, who are not close to the group. And for me, for example, I am from UCT, and I'm currently lecturing with the PKZ. So it tells us that what I'm being recruited from outside and not an internal group. So there are good side and bad side. An active effort is made to obtain the right person. Also, another thing is that it creates um, bringing new ideas, school of thought. So for me, coming from UCT, you realize that to focus on uh, issues that are basically more how often can you use it is what I'm, the new ideas I'm bringing to because somebody from UKZ will just be repeating what he was taught by his predecessors in UKZ and I coming from UCT I bring on board my UCT skills and then to adapt it with the new environment that I found myself. It also has its disadvantage in terms of the cost involved because you must I mean advertise in um, a more expensive places it is also risky because you cannot assess the person's ability and skills it is the morale of assistant personnel to make negative influence so people within the sector with their particular organization once they realize that they deserve certain positions they work with this company for 10 years they will do the supervisory role and we are bringing somebody from outside to supervise them they get demoralized they get demoralized so one important aspect of every organization is to balance this two to balance and the internal approach and the external approach because you must know when to apply both of them because both of them are needed for companies to have the growth that it needs. We can also talk about the recruitment procedure. So the recruitment procedure is about the featured resource record system. This every human manager must ensure that there's an efficient record system exists. In today's world, because of computer, has assisted people to keep track of every company's um, employees' uh, um, skill set and employees' um, efficiency in a computerized form, which we call the human resource information system. So this human resource information system should contain information on each employee's qualification, training, experience, as well as an assessment of achievement and interest. So with this uh, human resource information system, it helps the company to identify the talent and basically the skill set that are needed. Identify the company skill set that are needed. So recruitment from outside organization basically is more complex. So this um, skill sets and uh, the HRS may not be that uh, vital because it's, it becomes difficult for how to 
practice uh, people's uh, efficiency. And basically, what these companies do is to get on and refer them to what we call them and uh, their former bosses or reference so that they can give an attestation whether the people that you are recruiting basically have that skill set that they need. We move our discussion to look at the recruiting methods. So, human resource manager basically employs different recruitment methods, and some of them include recruitment through advertisement. So, this is very, very, very the most common form, and it's basically of high cost. So, through newspapers, um, through uh, um, newspapers or journals and bulletins. Most companies tend to um, advertise their campaign. Others do through, through, through private agencies or recruiting agencies. So these are what we call outsourcing. They are people who basically um, find themselves basically in terms of um, certain professional skills such as um, bankers or skill set. They tend to recruit those people for banks or other people in terms of particular skill set, and you pay them for uh, that. You can also have recruiting through existing employees. So sometimes you tell your employees that maybe they know people who have the same skill set. So, uh, for example, um, people of class um, um, or uh, people working at um, a particular chicken like in KFC, maybe they have people who may have certain skills in that same set and they help to employ them, restaurant kind of businesses. They tend to recommend their friends to be I mean, employed. So recruiting through personal approach. So for certain special jobs or top jobs, you realize that there are certain companies that basically approach, certain companies that approach. Even sometimes you realize that in most of our universities, they tend to come and they come here for um, identify certain persons and they tend to approach them and they recruit them. And we can also talk about uh, uh, even top government positions, like if government wants to employ, that's not approach. The government gives a point to an individual to approach. You can also talk about recruiting through radio, TV, and internet. And this is what you call the E and recruiting. So E recruiting, recruiting through the use of technology. And basically, it is the most important aspect in where people tend to bring on board their skill set, Facebook, they are what they are doing for them to be recruited. And people have recruited through all these aspects. It has its own benefits and its own disadvantages. The e-recruitment involves a shorter recruiting time. It attracts passive job seekers. It is not limited to local candidates, but provides wider, even global coverage. It may address targeted labor market interests. It reaches a wider range of applicants, broadening the selection pool. It results in lowering um, costs and it makes it Easier to apply for the job. Another thing that we can also talk about is the negative aspect of e recruiting. There's going to be high volume. Once you apply and you advertise in LinkedIn, people who don't qualify tend to even uh, employ. It can also result in updated resumes. And e recruiting tools may not be user friendly because there are some uh, people with a skill that may not be user friendly at all, not able to even identify the actual skills. They don't know that they are supposed to apply to those medium. And there's a lack of personal engagement and relationship between the candidate and organization. Between the candidate and organization. So we also have the sundry recruiting agency. And this is basically different from the personal approach. So the through the personal approach is when they basically um offer a particular management position, when they identify somebody and they approach the person to that position with the sundry position. As a, um, with the sandy position, they um, uh, visit certain um, skills, schools. So they come to certain schools to try to distinguish that from that one. And here they come to visit schools and draw um, employment opportunities. So they basically visit in Cape Town. We have a lot of emails from some companies where they are recruiting. And I'm sure in UKZ and too, there are a lot of uh, companies that come to recruit certain skill set from there. So basically, approach certain um, jobs and basically the idea is to have uh, and sometimes they need to support your crew even you are not competed this kind of um, reason is to even maybe support your education that when you're done you tend to work with them 
a few steady measures and start to support students in that field, get them that skill set they need. So these are some of the recruiting methods that we had discussed. Once the recruitment process has been gone through, identify the basic strategy of the various types of recruitment agency. Another responsibility of the human resource manager or the human resource department is to identify the talent. So selecting talent selection is the process, identify the right person who is basically suited for the position. Now, in identify the person who is basically suited for the position, there are three uh, phases that we can do this by the preliminary screening, intensive assessment, and the final selection. Now, for preliminary screening, for the preliminary screening, basically here we are, you know that when you apply for a job, a whole lot of people who apply, and there are people who don't qualify, so you have to separate the undesirable candidates or the unqualified candidates from theirs that are qualified. And you can do this by looking at their personal details that are the name, address, the educational qualification, and their work history. And with that, you can use them to do a short list and, and the people who are basically and, and needed. And the second thing to also to do is to do the intensive assessment. And when you talk of the intensive assessment, basically you can that is where you undergo the interview. And the interview can be through either psychological testing or the diagnostic testing. And the psychological testing can provide follow-up information about the individual, the person's um, applicant personality, ability, and management skills. Basically, through the psychological testing, you can be able to fish out all this uh, as competency assessment. You can all do all those things. And with the diagnostic interview here, you can basically be used to obtain information that was not highlighted in the test of, on the application form. So the interview basically through the performance through the interview past performance um, um, applicant can be assessed by asking new project or he or she can have initiated in previous job. The interview gives the human resource a chance to delve deeper um, into the shortcomings of the interview world. So good interviewing is asked questions to give no indication as of expected answer. So through the diagnostic interview, you can therefore elicit more information, functional roles of this individual and to see whether the person is indeed qualified. So we drew this um, interview, when it is done, then you can do the final uh, selection. So the final selection is that you um, list a few people that are basically uh, uh, those that are qualified. So from the interview, you should list those that are qualified. And with those that are qualified, you have to confirm with the reference, the referees, or the people who have attested to their skill sets and ability to find out whether every information that they have provided is indeed true and they are indeed the person that are needed for your job. And they are needed for your job. So that is why it is important that most people tend to um, um, your CV tend to provide that intend to provide that. And another thing that we are also going to uh, um, do, uh, the last thing to do is to the onboarding. So the onboarding basically is true when the person has been employed, the new person has been employed, how do you get a person familiarize himself with the company through induction, orientation, and socialization? You introduce the person to the new workplace, you let the person feel comfortable, if the person must undergo certain uh, uh, um, collaborating information with them, um, employees on how to familiarize them for himself with the new business. It's what you call the onboarding. Once the skill sets of the person have been identified and is on board, another important um, aspect of human resource is developing talent and the human resource development. So when we talk of human resource development, and we are saying that we need to give great opportunities for the employee to make themselves more vulnerable to the company through training and development. So basically, we have to basically talk about two things. That is the training and management, technical training and management training. So training involves providing employees with knowledge and skills needed to do a 
particular tax code. Particular tax code. When talk of developmental activities, a long term focus on preparing a future work responsibility. At the same time, increasing the capabilities of the employee. So there are two things that we are looking at when we talk of human resource management, human resource development, that the human resource development as a set of systematic and planned activities designed by an organization to provide its members opportunities to learn necessary skills to meet current and future job demands. So all what we are saying about in terms of developing talent is that you need to position human resource or train them so that they can have that skill set for them prepare them for current future or the job and, and, and requirements that are needed of them or the job demands. In terms of developing methods, we have basically two types of developing methods. We have what we call the on-job training development, and we have what we call away from the job training and development. And as on the job says, the on-job training basically the employee supervisor or experienced worker can learn from observing experienced employees by working with the materials, the personnel. So that's what we call the on-job training. So basically, if you want to train people, you want to develop their skills on the on-job training development type, you just the people that are working in there is where they tend to groom them in a different aspect. So some of these kind of on-job training methods include job rotation so job rotation is where we said you move one person from one department to another that's for the person to learn this today you learn that tomorrow and before you realize you are grooming the person it can also be job shadow so people who have already have that skills or have already trained maybe they are asked to follow this person you follow the or a superior or somebody who is trained in that specialized area and before you realize you tend to pick up the skills in that sense so you can also talk about um job enlargement and job enrichment. Here we are talking about responsibility. One day, responsibility is being uh, expanded. We can also talk about job instruction training. The job instruction training is a series of steps supervisors follow training their employees. We can talk about coaching. We can talk about mentoring. We can talk about apprenticeship or internships. These are all forms of on-job training. The all forms of all job training. You can also talk about the away from the job training. And away from the job training, basically, those ones are outside, outside the job market. So, training and development that includes any form of training formed away from the employee's immediate work area. Some of these include the lectures. So, through education, training, and development, practitioner can provide information to large group. So lectures are one. Conferences and discussion is also a way of gaining some training seminars, vegetables or simulation. So with vegetables or simulation, basically this form of training takes an idea where you create a, a similar work area. You are asking people to perform. So for example, you can take people to a, a terms of um, a training on the job, and people who work in terms of retail, do not ask them to work at the same field, but you take them to a new um, place or like just create a, an artificial or something closer to the uh, workplace and you ask them to and try to let them improve upon their performance. So that's of bank less retails, basically machine operation operators, you take them to a new place, and that's what we we'll call them uh, vegetables. They resemble the employees' workplace, and the employees made to, I mean, perform his or her duties. You can also talk about e-learning. Training, interaction models, and things in terms of web related kind of training. Web related kind of training. We can also talk about a case study. We can also talk about role playing. We can talk about the in market experience and assessment center. In market experience and assessment center. So, one thing we also look out for in terms of developing. Um, the danger of the short term approach to development. And when talk of this, it's an indiscriminate approach to development. The so indiscriminate approach to development, that is what we term as the short term approach. Because one um, focus is that 
if you train one employee in a, a particular standard, it means that it may be same for, or may be good for all other um, employees. So you are approaching a standard, a short approach, you are indiscriminate about approach or how you develop people, develop people on the same place. And once you develop uh, people with a particular standard, it's also same for all. So from this approach, it makes sure that organizations do not take time to do uh, training needs analysis. Do training needs analysis because it's the same standard you have applied to all of them. It's the same standard you have applied to all of them. And it has um, a valuable moment. So through this kind of analysis of the development needs that exist within the company, they choose training programs on the basis of how specific programs comply with these needs. Um, also, training money is spent only on members of staff who show the potential for further development. And also, the human resource manager makes plans with the immediate superior of the employee to consent to utilize his or her new skills or insights in the work situation. Now, another last aspect we also talk about the importance of the development talent is the performance appraisal. And this is very important. The performance appraisal here refers to um, assess or perform um, whether an employee has performed his exceptional skills well, complied with the requirement for the job, and not compiled or not complied with them. Whether the, um, the employee has performed well, whether the employee complied with the requirement for the job or did not comply with the requirement of the job. So these are basically three things that we talk about. So the performance appraisal is also for employee rating, employee evaluation, performance review, performance evaluation, and results appraisal. And in every company, it is very important for you to appraise and see whether the people are basically exhibiting the skills of qualification that they do. Even in case that then, as a lecturer, we realize that students are made to appraise um, lectures, whether they are giving them the right materials or whether there's the lecture's performance. So as class, you also do the same for me. And appraise me and it is to help the person to improve better. It is to help the person to improve better. Even the areas where he's doing well, he can as well, I mean, foster it much. So this is one aspect or one important area in terms of the development talent. This is the responsibility of every company, human resource, to also find ways of retaining talent. And retaining talent is to Compensation that basically goes to employees. So the compensation basically refers not just to the intrinsic rewards such as the salary and benefit, but also the intrinsic rewards such as the person's personal achievement. And also determine whether the employee should be promoted to the higher level or not. And to also provide the employee with feedback on how well he or she is performing. So one important aspect of retaining human resources on terms of retaining is the feedback. And the feedback is just a means to I mean, let the employee know and the strength, the weaknesses, and where he can I mean uh, uh, improve and to give specific desirable and undesirable behaviors without mentioning real life situation. Focus feedback on behavior and not the person. On the behavior, not the person feedback that will allow them for you to be successful. So once you are given a feedback, even terms of the appraisal of lectures of something is to give feedback so to make the person's progress and not um, the other way around. So feedback should be timely, conscious and specific. Limit feedback to the amount the employee can process and use um, active communication skills. Now, another aspect in terms of the conversation of competitions to retain your employees is the amount or the type of compensation. So we have three main types of compensation. We have the direct compensation, the indirect compensation, and the reward. Now with the direct compensation, basically is the compensation you receive for the work done as in the company. So the salary, what you are supposed to receive at the end of the month, and the wage, what you are being paid and daily or weekly. So that's what we call that as the wage. Now, most companies try to use what we call the PS wage system. The PS wage system tends to uh, make sure that there's no distinction between productive and non-productive workers. So the PS wage system here, the employee is compensated for the work done, the work he or she performs, regardless of the time taking or 
regardless of the time taking to perform the work. So that is what we call the PS break system. We also have the indirect compensation. And indirect compensation here is the French benefit that the company gives to the worker outside the salary. The French benefits can be as of leave benefits, holidays, and others. Um, when you are sick, you can write to the company and you, the company will be okay with that. You can also talk about the insurance company, insurance benefits in terms of medical, injury, pension, and others. We can also talk about um, housing benefits. Some companies give housing benefits in terms of rental subsidies, car benefits in terms of car subsidies and the likes. We can also talk about reward. We can also talk about reward as a type of um, uh, compensation. And the rewards here basically can be either salary increase, it can be financial bonuses, or it can be paid holidays or trips abroad. Now, other aspects for most companies, how much should a specific um, staff be paid or uh, compensated? was one of the most questions that most human resource managers face. How much of them, um, staff should be paid? So basically, we can do this by doing external comparison. That is, you compare um, people in a particular position with the people in your organization who are holding a particular position with people in a similar company. So if you're working with um, Standard Bank, how are people who are also tellers in Standard Bank and FMB paid? So it tends to work or pay them or compensate them in terms of those brackets. So you do that by using what you call the salary survey. Using what you call the salary survey. You can also do it by internal comparison. Internal comparison. Here, you tend to value the jobs and be compared with each other in terms of the demand they make on the employee. So in terms of the demand they make on the employee, you can do that. You can also uh, um, the internal comparison is also known as the job evaluation. So in terms of the comparison they make, you can use the ranking system and other means to determine how much each of them is performing and you pay them accordingly. You can also use the factor comparison method. You can also use the factor comparison method. Here, jobs are compared according to the demands they make on the employee in terms of the factors such as knowledge, communication skills, levels of responsibility, especially and um, decision-making skills and the others. So you compare, you list all these factors and you see how the person's communication skills are, all the, all the components of this individual. So the companies in terms of the decision-making skills, in terms of communication, in terms of the person's knowledge, the person's responsibility. With all these factors, you tend to give a evaluation of all this and compare all of them and do that you can compensate them accordingly.